really grateful for everyone joining us today. Today, I'm really excited. We have a very special guest, but before I get into our guest and all of that, I want to just thank you so much for all of the attention, all the ways that you've been consuming the content. It has been an honor to serve. Um, it's an, been an honor to put content out and have you guys give me incredible imp, uh, feedback and so forth. Uh, the other thing is, is that while this is airing, I am going to be on sabbatical. And so it's just a whole faith thing, even to trust that while I'm gone, you know, people are getting what they need and so forth. So anyway, I'm grateful for the channel and I'm grateful to also take a break that is incredibly needed, incredibly needed, but I'm thankful nonetheless. And if you have not subscribed, I'm really close to a thousand subscribers, please subscribe. Also like, share, hit the bell notification so that when new videos come out, you will be notified of them as well. All right, without further ado, let's get into our guest today, Mike Burns. Uh, many of you, many of you know who he is, and he <laughs> essentially needs no introduction, but he's been a disciple since 1999 and has served in the full-time ministry since 2004. He has a master's degree in Christian education and currently serves full-time as a teacher in the Twin Cities Church of Christ. And he and his wife, Mike Cresha, had been married going on 24 years in August. She is a critical care nurse and it has done very well. She's actually been recognized. It's an incredible story that she has as well. They have two adult sons, Elijah and Paviel. Mike is a writer, teacher, evangelist, and speaks extensively about race relations around the world. Mike, welcome to the show, brother. Thanks for having me, Kyle. You know it, man. I've been on your <laughs> all, all things to all people, right? I've been on that podcast, I think, four times i think that sounds right so i i owe you uh you owe me there's I owe no you. question man today the bill comes <laughs> due this is one of one of four so you got three more you owe me. <laughs> i'm kidding i'm kidding <laughs> but um, no, man, i'm just grateful to have you on we got a lot to get into today this is the last interview before my sabbatical and uh, it's just a great way to kick it off it's interesting when i interviewed jason yesterday uh, he told me, because I interviewed Joel on Friday, that you, Joel, and him, I think are all around this, from around the same area up in Wisconsin. Well, no, Joel, Joel kind of grew up in Minnesota. Oh, he grew um, up in Minnesota, but, that's right. <laughs> yeah, Jason and I are both from Wisconsin, yeah. You guys are all from a, the, the north, the great north. You guys are all kind of in that vicinity. It's... That's yeah, there's a there's a big difference between Wisconsin and Minnesota. So I can't, <laughs> we got to get that go one straight down that road, my friend. <laughs> All right, man. Tell us a little bit about your conversion and why you went into the ministry. Um. So okay, I grew up in, you know, going to church in a in a a great Christian home. You know, my parents uh, were very sincere followers of Jesus did the best they could. And they, they brought us up in a church and, and through no fault of their own, I don't think, um, you know, uh, the, the church I grew up in was like most churches, like a lot of churches and it had, you know, imperfect people. In it. And a, a lot of what I experienced, uh, not, not from my parents, but from everything else in the church was, you know, just a lot of hypocrisy, a lot of infighting, a lot of people who lost sight, I think, of what it really means to follow Jesus, and it turned it into a religion, and, um, you know, and so just all these sort of crazy things that, uh, you know, I remember one point even, uh, there was a minister that I really liked that they had there, and he basically got fired because he put his leaves in a jack-o-lantern uh, garbage bag and some people were really upset about the pagan connections of that and kind of ran him out of the church and these were the sorts of issues they were having and you know sin from the pastors in some instances and so by the time I got to college um, I was pretty much in my mind like been there done that I don't want much to do with Christianity or christians in general like it, it's just it's no different than anything else and so i might as well just go do 
what I want to do. It's fun, which is play basketball and try to get some girls and, you know, whatever else you can. And so, um, you know, during that time, I, I definitely matured. Um, but I don't think I changed my mind a whole lot on Christianity. Um, and then I met my wife and we got married. And uh, as you mentioned, in 1997. And so shortly after that, you know, then I think life starts to change. You're married, you have a kid, you're an adult now, you know, it's like, ooh, you know, maybe we should have a church for the kid to grow up in and be around. And, you know, so we kicked around that idea. Um, but, uh, you know, we went, we, we were living in Janesville, Wisconsin at the time, and we, we tried to visit a church and uh, just kind of experienced the same thing, just sort of, you know, people, I think, that had lost sight of following Jesus and kind of hypocritical in some ways. And so then we moved to Milwaukee. Um, we'd just been married not very long, moved to Milwaukee. And the first week, uh, first month, sorry, that we were there, um, in like five different places spread across the city of Milwaukee, sometimes together, sometimes apart, uh, we got invited out to church and we were like, well, that never happens. The town I grew up in, everybody has a church. You don't invite anyone to church. And so we were like, maybe that's just what happens in big cities. I don't know. And so we started to look at it and realize that uh, it was all the same church. And in fact, the last time we got invited was this brother. He, he lives up in Duluth, Minnesota now with his wife, uh, Joel and Sue Krolchak, and he had been praying that morning, uh, this is a true story, that God would give him the courage to reach out to the most intimidating person that he saw that day. So he stopped in a grocery store and looked down the <laughs> aisle and saw me and thought, that there you go. And so he, he went down and uh, reached out to me, and I was not super open at first, but um, we decided after a couple of weeks to, to go visit this church even though I, I was pretty skeptical. Um, and we went and we were really like uh, shocked, you know, by the, we walked in and it was like, whoa, this is a diverse church, which was a surprise to us. And that had been one of our sort of points of contention. It's like, well, where would we go to church? Would we go to a black church, a white church? Uh, she was actually more skeptical of the black church. I was more skeptical of white church. And so we couldn't quite find um, uh, a match, but didn't even know that a diverse church existed, honestly. And so that kind of caught our eye. But then, uh, you know, it was Wisconsin and football season was starting. And who can go to church when football season is starting? You know, the Packers, you got to you gotta watch the games. And uh, we were traveling on weekends to go back home and things like that. So. Uh, after visiting a couple of times, we didn't go back to the church again, probably for like a year. But to the credit of the brother who, who had reached out to us that last time, Joel, um, he pretty much called me weekly for a year just to check in, uh, you know, see how we were doing, see, ask if we wanted to come out to things. And it it was really annoying at first. And then somewhere throughout the course of that year, I started to think like, this guy might be my best friend. Like, <laughs> you know, <he's, laughs> I wound up talking to him a lot. And so we decided at a certain point to go out and uh, visit again. And we went for maybe two weeks and my wife came back to me and she was like, hey, the women said they're going to study the Bible with me. And uh, my response was, well, that's good for you. You need that. That'll be really, that'll be helpful <laughs> for you. You need that. <laughs> right, totally. And she said, uh, she said, but, you know, they said the, the, some of the brothers would study with you. And I was like, I don't, I don't need that. Like, I, I'm a Christian. I know what I'm doing. Um, and so, I, you know, I agreed to it. I was pretty prideful through my studies. We'll just we'll just leave it at that. I almost punched someone in one of my studies because they told me I was prideful. Um, <laughs> you know, it it, it took uh, a little bit of time, but eventually, I saw people who were still imperfect, 
but who wanted to keep following Jesus as the main point and not all that other stuff and who were genuinely trying to do that. And, and I'm not trying to imply that they were the only ones in the world doing that, but they were the ones that God led me to and the family that he planted me as an adult. And so on January 16th of 1999, my, uh, I got baptized. And then right after that, my wife got baptized. And we have been doing our best to follow Jesus ever since. Um, the first two years, I, I did a terrible job. If there was an award for like worst disciple in the Milwaukee Church of Christ, it probably would have been me. Uh, okay. I guarantee you, if there was if there was a category of least likely to go into the ministry, uh, I'm pretty sure I would have won that. And and that's not false humility. That's not if you talk to some of the old timers from Milwaukee, they'll go, yeah, there's there's truth to that. Um, I was a hothead. I had temper issues. I didn't like people. I didn't mm -hmm. talk with people much. Um, I wasn't super committed to stuff, uh, you know, just all kinds of issues. And, but folks were patient with me and just continued to try to love me and show me what it meant to follow Jesus. And then they called me in the carpet when, when I needed it. And, you know, not in a, their own opinions sort of way, you know, like, hey, this is what it looks like to follow Jesus. And are you going to do that or not? And there was literally a, a meeting where a couple uh, of couples got with us and was like, are you going to follow Jesus or not? And so at that point, I decided, you know what, I, I think I am. And I, I wanted to do no matter how much I don't feel up to it or, you know, whatever. And, and a lot of that was just pride. But a lot of it, too, is I think I was battling being an introvert and didn't know how to handle that and suddenly be part of this big community that hugged each other all the time was around each other um you know i was super shy as an introvert too not all introverts are shy but i was and so that that sort of fed into that um but i i turned around and just said man we're gonna i'll serve god in whatever way you asked me to uh was it too long before they asked us to lead the preteen ministry and we started doing that and had a, a ball with it and at that time, I was a high school history teacher and a basketball coach and was having a great time with that. Never saw myself going into the ministry. Didn't think that was, you know, just wasn't on my radar at all until my wife came to me and said, you know, I'd started teaching some lessons at church and some things. And we were doing the preteen ministry. And she was like, I think you should go into ministry. And I, my response was super spiritual. I was like, I think you've lost your mind. There's no way um, I'm going into ministry. But we, you know, we prayed about it. We got a lot of advice. And I remember finally I went to the evangelist at our church. And I'll just say this is early 2004. And so if you know, you know, sort of the history of our family of churches, this was not a time when people were flooding into the ministry in early 04. And I said, you know, I feel like maybe God's calling me into the ministry. I don't know what to do with that. And he said, in essence, I'd love to have you go in the ministry, but man, we don't have we don't have a position. I'd love to hire you, but we do, there's just nothing right now. And I said, oh, well, good. Okay, there you go. I won't go to the ministry. And he stopped and he looked at me and said, I didn't say that. I said, I can't hire you, but I find it interesting that you say you want to follow God, but you're unwilling to step out in faith. If God wants you to be in the ministry, um, then you should move down that road. And so I'd already expressed, well, if I'm going to do that, then I want to go back to school and get a, a master's degree. And so my wife and I prayed about it some more, and I turned in my um, resignation to the school where I was teaching. I signed up for, you know, master's school seminary and didn't have a job. And we were like, well, we'll just trust God to do it. And the three days before my last day at the school, I, I got a phone call from a friend of mine who was on staff at the church and said, hey, um, you know, something opened up. This brother that was on staff is uh, being activated and sent to Iraq. Do you want to be in the ministry, in the campus ministry? And I was like, 
I don't know anything about campus ministry. I've never been part of it, but I was like, sure, why not? If that's what God's called me to do, I'll do it. And so I, that was uh, end of 04, beginning of 05, and been um, in the ministry ever since. So that's how I got in the ministry. Uh, we did campus for about two years and then moved to Milwaukee to lead the church there as a teacher and uh, uh, moved, sorry, moved from Milwaukee to Appleton to lead the church there. And um, uh, we were there five years. And then after that, moved to Minneapolis to just focus on uh, being a teacher. And that's where we're at right now. Well, speaking of being a teacher and then, I mean, the world has sort of requested you. I mean, you've been all around the world and that was a lot. I remember, I think we were down, maybe as a teacher's conference, we were riding in the car with Beth Pachta and we were talking and, and you were telling me about your schedule for like a stint of like a year or two. It was just, I mean, you were stacked. And then you recently took a sabbatical. I don't know if our, many of our listeners even know about this, but you worked hard, but then there came a period where you, where you rested and you really, uh, yeah, you recharged. Can you tell us a little bit about your sabbatical and some of the things you learned? Yeah, so uh, I think I should probably say first that, you know, our friend Joel, whom you've already mentioned, really has been an advocate for the need for uh, especially ministers to take a sabbatical regularly, that it's just a different sort of job. You, you know, I, I've had a job that most people would consider pretty challenging. I think inner city school teacher, you know, coaching in that environment. And it doesn't hold a candle to the unique sort of pressures of ministry. And so uh, he'd been trying to get me for years to take a sabbatical. And as always, I was stubborn. And, and I finally gave in to the idea and agreed to do it. So we started a three-month sabbatical in March, the last piece of March, and then April, May, and most of June, and we're just coming off of that sabbatical. And so one of the things there is I'd had other people who had taken sabbaticals before tell me, here's how it's going to go. And I didn't think they were correct, right? But it, it, it proved to be absolutely correct, which is it took me about a month to recognize that I was actually on sabbatical. And that, you know, I didn't have the same sorts of pressures and things that I needed to do and didn't have to feel guilty about just doing much of nothing all day, you know, maybe going, working out, going for a prayer walk and then just reading all day. Um, so it took me about a month to wrap my mind around that. And then I had an actual sabbatical for a month. And then it takes you the last month to start preparing yourself mentally to go back. And so... You know, I think I, I learned a bunch of lessons um, during that time. The the first one, just on a personal, simple level, is I think in the early, maybe the first couple of weeks of the sabbatical, I saw an interview with uh, Michelle Obama, former first lady, and they were asking her about life after the White House. And she said, you know, you don't realize how much how much you do and how much pressure you're under and how, you know, you just go about life and things are what they are. And she said, and then we stepped out of that role and all of a sudden it's just her and Barack all day long. And, you know, she said, all of a sudden you start to realize you're hanging out and you're like, oh, that's why I married this person. Like, he's kind of cute. And I, I sort of like being around him. And remember those sorts of things. And I think maybe not to the same degree, but I think, you know, there, uh, we were stretched. Um, I'll get to that in a minute. But I think that was kind of the first lesson was like just being able to spend some amazing time with my wife. We went away, spent a couple of months of that time in, in, uh, in California in the middle of nowhere. And just kind of like, oh my life's kind of cute i kind of like being around her she's sort of fun and we we have fun together i remember that having fun together and you know all of that so that that was one lesson i i think another one is just how important rest is as a discipline 
uh, as, as a part of life. And whether you have a role where you can or need to take some extended time away, or you don't have that luxury, but taking, you know, regularly a day. I mean, one of the big mistakes I made, Kyle, was um, I didn't really take a day off in the ministry for the first 16 years. And I kind of saw that as a point of like, you know, I don't need it. I keep driving. Uh, I'm, I'm an athlete. It's what I do. I don't, I don't need rest. Um, you know, one, one of my sayings was always uh, tired is a choice, you know, and uh, I, I can just keep pushing. And well, in one sense, I suppose maybe God wired me in such a way that that was true for me. And, and, and I never held that to other people. I never like judged other people to that standard. Um, but it's, it, it's just not the wisest way to go. It's not a biblical way to go. And so I think trying to, you know, I've learned the lesson and want to come back. You know, the first thing we did in coming back was to say to our, our teen workers who, you know, we have the pleasure of working with and serving with and all that. We said, you know what? Take a couple months off. You guys have been working hard. We'll cover for you. We just got some rest. And so working that into every ministry, I'd love to see that where, you know, as part of the church, it's just people have a season where they can rest. Maybe it's a month off from that ministry without everybody, you know, turning a side eye and thinking they're faithless or whatever. Um, you know, maybe Good it's point. having having a month where the whole church just kind of shuts it down to the bare essentials for a month and rests and just has the bare essential meetings or something and really encourages a uh, fun and you know that sort of thing however it may look um i think rest is an important spiritual discipline and, and one that god worked into the order of creation before the law and that's continued after the law and so i don't think we necessarily need to hold to a you know like the sabbath as in the old testament law but we need to have the sabbath means rest and so we need to have that as you know it doesn't have to be one specific day from sun down to sun you know and so on 24 hours but it, it needs to be part of our regular routine to be rested i think the other part of that that i learned is um part part of that especially when you're in the ministry is is growing in your faith God doesn't need me to keep everything going. Um, I can step away and guess what? God will take care of it. And I know for me, there was a big temptation a couple weeks into um, the uh, uh, our sabbatical. There was another shooting in Minnesota. And then the Chauvin trial uh, was starting. And there was this real temptation. I started getting you know, the messages that were like, hey, I know you're on sabbatical, but sort of messages. And the, you know, I, it was a great opportunity for me to step back and go, I don't need to engage in these things. God's got plenty of other people. God's got, you know, in Minnesota, in the Midwest, across the world, like it doesn't always have to be me. So there's an element of pride there that I learned, um, you know, was was exposed again that, hey, I don't always have to be the guy. On the other end of it, I think the pressure for me to constantly push myself in ministry and stretch way more than what was wise is, uh, if I'm honest, was an insecurity, was a level of people would ask me to do things. And I'm in my mind, I'd be like, well, who am I to say no? They're asking me, I, you know, I'm, I'm nobody. So I, yeah, I guess I'll just say yes and, and do what I can. And, uh, you know, especially when you have really important people asking you to do these things, um, I'm like, okay. Um, and so I, I, I think I learned over the sabbatical, my need to just be able to say, no, um, I can't do that. I can't, you know, um, I look back, dude, it, you know, we had a travel schedule that was pretty crazy for a couple of years and then kind of got a handle on that and got some input and got that down to a reasonable amount. And then when COVID hit, dude, you know, just started getting all these requests to speak. 
And I think between, I, I'm guessing here, but it's a, it's a fairly, I think, uh, educated guess is between April of 21 and probably, or April of 20 and March of 21, I probably spoke to 200 groups, you know, on Zoom. And there were days where I would do two or three, four hour workshops. Oh my goodness. Uh, you know, on a Saturday or something and, and spread out throughout the day or three or four midweeks and a night for groups in different time zones and um, not wise, you know, just because, hey, pe people were like, hey, we need help. Can you speak on this? And, and, I, and I wanted to help, um, you know, so it wasn't all insecurity and pride. I mean, I'm like, okay, I'm just trying to help. I'm trying to serve. And, you know, there's part of me that drives me in ministry is always like, man, if people are going to support me with their money, like, I, I, I got to work hard. I can't take a time off. And then that sort of mixes with your own neuroses where, you know, a lot of days I would work 14, 16, 18 hour days. And then maybe at the end of the day, I'm like, okay, I'm going to just chill and watch something on Netflix here for 10 minutes before I go to sleep. And I would actually feel guilty about that. I feel like, you know, what if somebody saw me just sitting here watching Netflix and relaxing? And so, um, Probably where I came to terms with that was sitting at a hotel pool. And I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to sit here by this pool and do nothing today. And I told one of my good friends about that. He's like, you did what? Like, he texted him. He's like, that's so Big huge deal. for you. You just sat by a pool. Um, and so, uh, you know, all of that. And, I, and I'll say lastly here, you know, I just think that ministers need time with god without other demands that's not a vacation that's not a, a break even it is a, an absolute necessity i think in the ministry in a way that periodically you just have to do and joel teaches a lot about this but you just can't you know you're pouring yourself out in a way that you you know if you think of like a phone battery you can never fully recharge when you're in the day-to-day -day ministry you can recharge a little bit but there has to be that time where there's like it's just me and god and there's no other pressures there's no other you know i even uh, if i'm going to be honest kyle i even had a time where the first month i was like man i almost feel like i need to relearn how to connect with god and pray and god i'm just going to pray me and you and i'm not even going to pray for other people for like a month because I felt like that's that's all I did. And there wasn't really a connection there anymore, if that makes sense. It was just like me going to God and saying, hey, here's what everyone else needs. And so I said, I just need to take a month here where I go on these prayer times or whatever. And just, it's just me and God. I'm not going to, you know, God, you got those other folks right now. I'm not, I'm not going to worry about that. And, and so reconnecting. Because there is a, a pressure on ministry like no other. Paul says in Second Corinthians, he's like, man, there's, you know, shipwrecks and prison and all this and that. And then he says, but what's more is the daily pressure of the ministry. And, and you know, it's a great joy and it's an incredible privilege. But I, I would encourage people with your ministers, if you're not a minister, to just understand the challenge and demands and that they, you know, encourage them to get regular retreats, to go be with God. They're, they're not sitting by pools eating, you know, bonbons all day. Although I did sit by a pool one day. That's right. Um, that's right. But it, you know, it was about really reconnecting uh, with God and, and figuring out how to do that. And then coming back with the conviction of like, okay, I can't, this is not something I can just do every seven years for three months. I need to have this as a regular part of my life and walk uh, spiritually. Yeah, that's one thing that for me, when I'm when I'm taking my sabbatical, I even thought about it yesterday on the prayer walk. Like, what is my plan? Part of the plan is not going to be is going to be not having a plan. Number one, but genuinely speaking, I was like, I just want to read the Gospels and I just want to know. I just want to know Jesus. I feel like I, I spent a lot of my time in like the Pauline epistles for different reasons, and just Paul's theology about what it means to be human and so forth, and you know. I just, I love reading in the Greek and also the Hebrew and all of that. And, and then there's just like this loss of, you know, you only have so much time. How do I, 
okay, there's a, there's, this is about a relationship, not just the, you know, serving people and all of that. And I, I, I'm just excited about getting to read about Jesus and in July, I might just go through the gospels and yeah. do some deeper study. You know, I, I think as a teacher, you know, I, I yearn for, for context and, and depth and things, but <clears throat> then there's just the, you know, relationship with God is a contact sport. And so is being in relationship with other people. So you've, you've said a lot, I, I think for members and ministers, both, uh, in what you just shared, I, I really appreciate that. Um, let me, let me ask you this question. We are trying to come up with ways to sustainably be healthy as we grow and evangelize. And, you know, when we think of studying the Bible with people, you know, we are inviting them into a relational rest where, I mean, Hey, you're, you're going to enter a relationship with God and, and sir, there's like a form of Sabbath that they're entering. It's kind of an interesting de deal there, but when people are converted, um, we don't just convert people, we convert culture and, or we can sanitize it, which is something I've been thinking about recently, how sometimes we think that something is sanctified, but really it's sanitized and we have to know the difference. And so when we study the Bible with people, Mike, it's getting messy. Uh, I remember I did a Bible study last year with someone, or maybe, no, it was earlier this year. I think we were doing the cross. And this person brought up Breonna Taylor and George Floyd. And I remember I, I just, in not in an arrogant way, but I was like, man, if I wasn't here and I hadn't been going through what I've been going through in the last you know, handful of years, I wouldn't have been able to have an apologetic for that. I wouldn't be able to have an appropriate answer and how I answered this person was interesting. It's from another time, but these things are coming up now in Bible studies. You know, we can't just shut off culture and then study the Bible with people. No, no, people need a way to be human and a way to bring their culture into it. And, and culture is not necessarily a sinful culture. It, you know what I mean? We bring kingdom, we, right. you know, we bring kingdom to cultures really kind of, I think what it is, but yeah, how, how do we need to kind of start maybe being a little bit more adaptable as we think yeah. of studying the Bible with people and culture? Yeah, well, you bring up a huge topic, and I think it's a, it's really an important one. And, you know, in many respects, that's the heart and soul of a, a lot of our ministry. Um, my wife and I over the last few years with some of our books and a lot of what we speak on. And I think... You know, the nature of Christianity, it was decided sort of once and for all in Acts 15 that Christianity was not going to be culturally bound. That's really the heart of the question there is what do we do with the Gentiles? Do they have to become Jews culturally and religiously um, in order to be Christians? And the, determin the determination was no. They just do these two things really just out of respect for Jews. And even those two things didn't seem to, you know, or at least the one of them, of course, sexual immorality. But that that even meant something different to the Gentiles, I think. I don't think they were informing the Gentiles that they couldn't, you know, commit adultery. I think when it says don't have sexual immorality, it was addressing the aspect of their culture, for example, that thought, oh, it's not immoral to have sex with a slave girl or boy. That's perfectly fine. That's not adultery. And so they're saying, no, 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 that's all immorality. Stay away from that. But the, the second one was about meat uh, and, you know, blood and strangled and all that. And stay away from that out of respect to the Jews. But that seems to be dropped in, in later years. Uh, but the, the determination there is Christianity is not going to be culturally bound. It's going to adapt to every culture, you know, wherever it goes. So culture is a part of life. If anybody says, you know, culture is unbiblical or something, well, that, that's like saying breathing is unspiritual. You have to breathe. We, we have culture. It's how we operate. And it's just... All culture is, is the unwritten rules that a group of people believe on. Like it, it, Culture is the pronouns of life, right? It's just shortening things so we don't have to explain everything that we're doing to everybody. It's just the assumptions that we make. And so the gospel yeah. can absolutely adapt to culture. Um, can culture lead the Bible? Well, sure. And we've got to be on guard for that. Um, but... 
I think there's a danger there. We could get into a whole other session there. But I, I think, you know, uh, giving into the culture is always what the other person does, right? So it's like, oh, they're giving into culture, but not me. I'm just spiritually led. And, and we tend to not Good see one. the way that we do it ourselves. And so there's a lot of hypocrisy going around when it comes to calling out uh, you're being led by the culture. And, and we're all sort of guilty of that. And we need to check one another and be humble and listen. Uh, but the, I think one of the challenges currently that you're sort of getting at is uh, the reality that there, there are two sides in a sense to maybe oversimplify it a bit of our walks in following Jesus. There's the material and the spiritual. And at various different times, we overemphasize one and maybe underemphasize the other. If we get too caught up in the material, you can go down the road of just being social gospel and helping and serving, but not really worrying about uh, sin or the salvation side of it or forgiveness of sins and, you know, all those things that sort of come with that spiritual aspect. But there's also the equal danger of overemphasizing the spiritual and thinking, well, all we need you to do is believe this set of beliefs and then you get baptized and have your sins forgiven and now you go to heaven one day and you're good. And the goal then is not to be sullied by the world and to, be, you know, have that. We don't have to worry about that because uh, this world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. I don't actually like the theology of that song. I think it's sort of misleading. Uh, you know, if you're going to go that route, I would rather us sing, this is my father's world, where mm. there's a balance there of, yes, God cares about the material. Mm -hmm. Jesus demonstrates that. Jesus came and definitely addressed the spiritual, but he also addressed the material. He, he just did. He did both. And there's a balance. And so... I think we have gotten, we're in one of those swings the last few decades or century or so where we are really, you know, up to par on the spiritual, but we've neglected the material. Well, it doesn't matter. It, you know, ultimately, it doesn't matter if people are hungry, if people are uh, being treated unequal, if there's injustice running rampant. Because what they really need is their sins forgiven so that they can go to heaven. But, you know, I think Jesus walked that line. Luke 4, hey, I've come to preach good news to the oppressed and the blind and the prisoner and all that. Now, he didn't go all that way and say, so our agenda is going to be let's break everybody out of jail. and Let's just go feed the poor. But he did do those things. They did. The early church cared about those things. And so I, I think we, we can tend to neglect some of those things. And, and well, those are matters of the world. We don't have to worry about. Uh, but we do. If, our, if our, the spirituality part of our faith is true, then it's also going to address the material. And one of the big challenges for that, I think, comes down to allegiance. Is we're called to, you know, I won't go all into it, but the shorthand is we're called to allegiance to jesus as our king and i think in our movement in our family of churches we do a really good job of sitting down and studying the spiritual side with people hey what are your sins are you going to make jesus lord what does this look like and we you know we really go through with people but we don't really look at that material side what are your other allegiances do you have political allegiances that rival jesus as king do you have you know ideological do you have ethnic allegiances do you have these other allegiances that you smuggle in with us through the waters of baptism? Mm. And then we get there and we have these other allegiances and it becomes pretty clear to the world. They see it. We're blind to it, but they see it. And mm. so I think actually, you know, how are we going to go about sustainable evangelism and speak to the culture? I think it starts with examining our own allegiances. Uh, you know, I, I have trouble, for instance, you might even say, b before we even get into anything, hey, let's have a conversation about race and culture and what that's going to look like. And you start getting shouted down. Well, that's political. That's this and that. And it's like, 
Well, no, it's not. This is a super spiritual topic. Paul talked about it all the time. Jesus talked about the gathering of the nations. Paul talked about culture and how we're going to adapt and bring in all these cultures and <clears throat> all of that. But it, what people don't realize is it's a it's a political instinct of theirs, and they've been discipled by a particular political worldview to say, no, we're not going to talk about it. Or on the other end, some people have been discipled by the opposite political worldview, and then they get all sort of off kilter in that. And and both sides, I think, can be equally guilty of not truly wrestling with what it looks like to have a sole allegiance to Jesus in these areas. If we get that on straight, then I think we can start to show the world the kingdom as it's supposed to be, a true alternative, a true different way of living. Because, I, you know, I say it often, if the kingdom looks just like the options of the world, then kind of what's the point? You know, it's it's got to be different. It's got to be not just spiritually different, but also materially different. And, and so that's a challenge. And I've seen, and I'll finish up the answer here, Kyle, but I've, I've seen you know, where I talk about this amazing kingdom and being an alternate uh, to the empire and truly different way of living that makes Jesus as king in every area of life, not just the spiritual, but goes after injustices and, you know, equals the playing field as Paul calls for in 1 Corinthians 12, 21 to 26 and things like that. And I've had young people, and this is heartbreaking, they'll look at me and say, I love that vision of the kingdom but I don't know if I've ever seen it. And so if I don't see that, mm -hmm. what am I supposed to do? Just ignore the injustices of the world, just not care about them. And so my generation, I think, swung a little more towards the spiritual. The younger generation has seen the imbalance of that, and they're swinging more towards the, addressing the material with the gospel. I think it's really incumbent on our generation and up to say, man, let's not denounce them. Let's celebrate that they see the errors, that they want to address the material side with the gospel, but let's help them find a balance. And I think the way we do that is not by chiding them, not by getting on the younger generation and saying, oh, you just care about those social justice issues. It's by us engaging and balancing and showing them a, a balanced way. So I, I think it's really going to start with those of us who are maybe 35 and up. Mm -hmm. um, you like how I included myself in there the 35? Go. There you go. Down, I, down you, the 35 you smuggled category. it. You smuggled it. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I think that's, that's where it starts. And then we can start to show the world a true difference. So again, I, you, you mentioned the, the term in your work, cultural humility mm -hmm. i think there's an i think there's a a level of cultural competency yep wherein so take gayrod wilmore he wrote a book called black religion and black radicalism and towards the end of the book he breaks down a bit of a primer in terms of the the black psyche you you had mentioned marginalized people groups oppressed people groups we know how to to some degree we know how to work with the worried well like, hey, you know, you've got life going really well, but you know, let's say you're not getting along with your spouse, but in other populations, there's more dire situations that they're in. So he has this primer and it's survival, ele elevation and liberation. Survival, when, you, when you're dealing with the black psyche and the, the way that a lot of those in the black community grew up and still kind of have is their psyche collectively is this, I'm surviving. I'm just, if you ask, typically you ask a person, yeah, yeah, yeah. how are you doing? Yep. I'm surviving, man. I'm, 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 I'm living like, and there's this almost bottom of the trough statement that can be made that comes from somewhere. And that's a part of that collective sort of experience that many people yeah. in the black community have had. Then you have elevation. This is the one that really can get, uh, go to the pendulum. So elevation is now I want to come up to where I'm the same as I'm treated equally. And I think equality has different definitions. <laughs> we don't have time to get into that, but elevation is the second piece of 
in the, the black struggle, if you will, is this idea of elevating, elevating your consciousness, elevating yourself to where you're a generational wealth maker and these things. And so let's elevate <coughs> black people. Um, and then there's liberation, which is beyond being elevated to being equal. It's being able to go and surpass and so forth. And it's just that, that way of thinking about how a lot of black people um, grow up and the messages. Even when I think a person of color, I was told you have to work twice as hard to look half as good. And that's still a running mantra in my family. We baptize somebody and we baptize different temperaments. We, we baptize different psychological profiles. We baptize people who come in with this indoctrination that most people, it's so subtle. They don't even think to ask, hey, what messages were you, did you grow up with about being black? Well, you gotta work twice as hard to look half as good, but you really can't trust the white man. Not for real, for real. And, and so those are the subtle things that we don't even, for a while, we probably didn't even ask about. Um, and then when you deculture something, that's completely off the agenda. Um, for me, I came to the church because I wanted a way out of the, I wanted, I wanted a way out of the dilemma. I didn't want the wounds. And so I just wanted to create space between me and those insecurities. And I found through no fault of the church, uh, but I found a place that was more than willing to help me to do that mm -hmm. <clears throat> and, uh, and forget and really distance myself from those questions. Uh, anyway, so I just, I kind of, I think there's different primers. I wouldn't say that that's a, you know, a catch all that works for every black person or every population that's marginalized. But if you're white, to, you know, if you're middle to upper class, whoever you are, how you look at people is going to change the, the, how you think about evangelism. And I, I think part of, it's just hard, you know, what I've found in the last year, I'll just say this, it's been hard for people to stretch and really put themselves in the other, their position, like marginalized people. It's just, it stretches some people so much psychologically and emotionally. And it's just for them, they just can't get there. Like I want to try to lean and understand what it's like to be oppressed, what it's like to be victim. I want to understand what it's like to be racially profiled, but I just can't get there. And I try so hard, but I can't get there. And so people have been stuck. And to you, to your point, you know, we also, you know, see, see that people have a prior commitment, which interferes sometimes with, with yeah. being able to get there. But anyway, I just, I appreciate what you're saying. And there's a lot of different avenues, I suppose. <laughs> well, and, and, and let me add to that real quick. First of all, I want to say, let me dial back just a little bit, uh, something I said at the end of my last answer, which was, you know, when we do this, we'll start to make a difference. Um, that's not a fair statement. We, you know, I think we've been showing the world or start to show how we're really different. I think, you know, Christians have been showing the world how we're different, but I think it's, it's more, we'll take the next steps needed with where the culture is at and really grow in the way that's needed. So I don't want to imply that nothing's been going on and now we're going to start. Sure. Um, but I think you're, I think you're spot on with that. I, you know, there is a tendency for those who are rich to tend more towards the spiritual and not have to address the material. Um, and there has to be a realization in the American church in the 21st century that we are mostly all rich, even if you don't feel that way compared to the rest of the world and certainly to the biblical world, we are rich. And we, we have a tendency then with that to and it's kind of an american thing to a degree is we like to read ourselves in as the hero of every story so we identify with joseph rather than the egyptian pharaoh we identify with blessed are the poor rather than the rich romans that are oppressing folks or you know whatever yep. and i think that obfuscates the ability to see ourselves for where we really need to be challenged, uh, to see and em empath empathize with the other, as as you're talking about, and and really address the gospel in the way that the Bible is written and how it really wants to be applied. Because we, you know, read "Blessed are the poor" and we go, "Oh, we're I'm poor," you know. But what, what an encouragement this is to me that you know, don't worry, because God will provide me what I need. 
I'm not really the poor person he's talking to there. <laughs> you know, I'm the rich person over on the other side. And so I need to see, oh, that means that this is going to be applied in a different sort of way. This gives me a different challenge if I can properly locate myself in the story. So I, uh, yeah, I'll stop there and let you go on. But uh, that's a good point you bring up. No, I appreciate that. And I, I, I always think of like when, when Paul rebukes Peter, you know, Peter's trying to play both sides and, and, and it's interesting how, who we would want to relate to. Am I Paul or am I Peter? Sure. And, and I believe it's Galatians too. And, yep. you know, poses him to the face and it's this moment of, you know, he just confronts the hypocrisy and, and, you know, it's easy to want to be the Paul and see ourselves, but then it's another reaction to be offended at the mere notion that we are not Paul in that scenario. And I do find that for a lot of people, there's just a lot of change. I know it feels threatening. I think a lot of people have a theology that is in threat and it's, it's difficult. I think there's people, I believe that good theology is therapeutic. You know, this channel is really about helping people with their trauma and and, and with their theology. And we want to have a, th you know, we want to have a therapeutic theology. I think one of the best ways to have a therapeutic theology is to be culturally uh, sensitive and culturally humble. And I think that's a incredible for the church to, to grow in. Let me, let me move on here. Uh, you've got a series coming out here called the great lie. Really interested about that. And I think there's a lead in that we're going to touch on here. It's pretty exciting here in just a moment. But can you tell us a little bit about your great lie discussion that you're having on your podcast right now? Yeah, so we'll be in August, August 3rd, we'll be kicking off season three of my podcast. And um, I'm loosely calling season three, the great lie. That's that's the title of it. And so, uh, you know, I want to dig in and, and, and look at some things. And, and the way I would distinguish it is the great lie really goes back to Genesis 3, you know, where Satan's like, did God really say? And what we see is different versions of that lie. And there's a pretty big one that hits the world in the 15th century. And I, I think maybe I'll leave just a, a small air of mystery and say, you, you got to tune into the podcast to find out exactly what that was. But um, in the 1450s, a big lie that is a new version of the great lie, did God really say, hits the world. And it's been ripping through the world ever since then, uh, dividing people, recreating our identities, um, not in the image of God, but really in the image of ourselves and redefining who we think we are. And, and I've got to say, we've all been discipled and brainwashed and affected by this lie. And it just absolutely continues to affect us to this day. Now, one of the things we tend to do is we lose sight of Ephesians, where it says our, our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and principalities and so on. Um, of this world. And so we start to think, well, you know who really is the problem here? It's that group of people. It's that racial group or that political group or that country. But that's not true. What the real issue is the father of lies. What has he been up to? What is that lie? How has he fooled all of us? And what do we need to do to be people of truth, to not just uh, counter, make a counterclaim against that lie, but I think we're also called by the Bible to go and tear down the structures that are falsely built on that lie. And it's going to take discipling. It's been 500 years of being discipled into that lie that we all accept at one level or another. And to sort of re-disciple ourselves uh, along those lines. So that's what we're going to get into in season three. Did I give you enough information or was that? No, it's good. Too... Cryptic is, is less is more in this case. I'll take it, man. 
Yeah, I, but we 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 do have uh I, we do have kind of a, a news breaking announcement. Can we can we do that or are we? Oh man, I think that would be great, man. I, I think we got to tell the people. We got to be right. honest with the people. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We got we got to come clean, right? Because it, it's actually exciting, and so I, I'll just kind of kick it off, and then love to hear you add to it. Yeah. But um, so the the podcast we're calling the 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 great lie and. The, there's a working title of a book that's coming out that's the the big lie of race and it goes on from there um but you and i are actually working on that book together yes we are and so um, we're going to be getting into history theology uh, how paul would address these issues how he builds on the truth of the gathering of the nations that jesus uh introduces and uh you're good you, you know kind of the the history and all that that's kind of my side and you're going to deal with some of the trauma theology and how we address that and so we're uh we're, we're very early in that process so i would say please don't ask us when the book's going to be done please uh, <laughs> we we do have sort of a target date but i don't think we're going to release that right we're not going to let no we're not get... talking about that <laughs> yeah, because we, we might blow right past that. So, but what, what are your thoughts on that, Kyle? What no, I'm excited. Doing? It's an honor. And I think it was when I came on your last podcast, whenever that was, I don't know if it, just kind of this feeling, the spirit was just like, hey, you know, see about collabing with Mike. And uh, I mean, people don't even know. <clears throat> so four years ago, I remember calling you. I remember exactly where I was. I was in my grandparents' living room when they still had their house. And I called you and asked you just about the process of, of, of teaching and, and what that, <laughs> excuse me, journey was for you four years, fast forward. And, and back then you were, you were like, you, I remember you, I always remember what you told me. You were like, if you ever need anything, call me. And you're like, I mean that. And that has been the case over four years. And so I just think the relationship I built with you over the last four years, and then to be able to do something together is an honor. And I'm excited about it. I'm excited about the piece to where we're going to be addressing the the marriage of intergenerational trauma and uh, ra the history of, 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 you know, racial discrimination and, and slavery and all that, because the mental health piece and then the trauma piece on top of that has not been adequately married in terms of theologically. So what you'll see is some amazing stuff done in terms of the intergenerational stuff like uh, DeGroy and Ruth Thompson Miller, like they are segregation stress syndrome and post traumatic stress syndrome. They've outlined that, but there's not the marriage with the theology. And so this is going to be an important place where we're going to have a lot of intersex history, theology, mental health, intergenerational trauma, PTSD. I mean, we are putting it all in. And I think it'll be quite co comprehensive for people. Yeah. So that's why we're not telling people when we're releasing it because we want to do the best job. <laughs> we can and right because yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. it's gonna be big no yeah i'm i'm excited and i i, I think that'll be great and i love the the pieces of that that you bring and i think you know if you just look on a practical level and say you know race culture our history all of that it's still such a sore spot in the church there's still things we can't talk about and it causes conflict that we have to address it with the gospel. You, you know, I, I've often used the analogy that if you're in a marriage and there are areas that you can't talk about or it causes a fight every time you talk about it, uh, those are sore spots. Those are areas where there's there's a lack of health. And so we have to be able to address these issues with the gospel, talk through them, uh, look at them and, and really analyze them and, and maybe start you know or really continue and carry on that healing process and so uh i'm looking forward to it i'm looking forward to the ways we're gonna try to connect all this because i think we have some idea but you always discover as you go and write right we you learn new things yeah. books take on a life of their own and uh, i've never had a book that ended up with what i thought it was going to be when i started Here it always go. becomes something different so I look forward to that process, and and uh, there's another little announcement. Can I make that one about August uh, regarding you? Is that something we can? Uh, oh wow! Yeah, we. I guess we could. 
<laughs> yeah, you, you know about that one. But in August, you're being appointed officially a teacher yeah. in the church, which is uh, really cool. And I think it's always just a recognition of what you're doing anyways. Uh, it's not a, a new assignment. So congratulations on that. I'm, I'm glad that uh, we're going to be able to zoom into Omaha that day to fly in and be part of that. So I look forward to that. When you said zoom in, I got nervous. I was like, wait, it's going to be over Zoom? Oh, no, yeah, yeah, that's, <laughs> that's a misnomer these days, right? No. No, we're, no, we're flying in um, to the Grand Airport in Omaha. Oh, so, man, uh, it is grand. Brother, That that's so encouraging. And I honestly, it slipped my mind. I, to be honest with you, I, I was thinking about doing it in July, but I, after getting some coaching from Joel about Sabbath, sabbath and taking a sabbatical it's like no i'm gonna move it and uh, it's just an honor i i tell you man i you told me something a while ago about being a teacher and this is a great lead in to our last piece you're like how there's no set formula there, there, there isn't don't don't look for that and i have found that to be so true you're mentioning with the book how you end up with something very different from what you begin with and i think very similarly on the road to becoming someone who can minister to people and teach them it has, it's, it's been very disorienting. Like half the time I didn't know what God was trying to do and what this ministry even was like, I'm in seminary doing theology and all this stuff, but then I'm a counselor and I'm seeing people in my office and it's like, wait, how does this fit? And then we add the racial component in. I'm like, God, I don't understand what this is. This feels very fracturing, but really if you can survive that learning curve, is an incredible ministry and competency to hold things that are so hard to hold together. You can hold that tension. And so, but it has not been linear at all. Like there's nothing right. linear. There's nothing. It's just been humbling. And if anything, I could say, Mike, because I feel even more de-skilled. Like, yeah, I think I know what I'm doing. But honestly, <laughs> there's many days where you're like, what do I really know? You know, right. so there's always that. When, when, are, when are they all going to figure out that this is just smoke and mirrors? They're going to know the truth. Anymore, right? The gig is up, man. What advice do you have for young teachers like myself coming up? Because the next wave of teachers, man, they are, we got some interesting cats coming up, like for real. Yeah. Man. You know, that, that's such an interesting question. And I mean, there's a lot of different answers I could give to that, but I think the I, I'll limit myself to one. And I, 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 I was talking to a group recently and I said, let me tell you guys how Douglas Jacoby almost ruined my life, but never knew it. And, and I'll just say, I love Douglas Jacoby. He's a great Bible teacher. There's nothing <laughs> that he actually did. He's a, he's a very kind, gracious man. Um, but when I was first appointed teacher, I was like, okay, well, who's the biggest teacher I know? It's Douglas Jacoby. And there are others, you know, there's Steve Kennard and there's Steve Staten and there's John Oaks and these guys. And I was like, okay, I have to be a teacher like they are. I, so, you know, I have to do the kind of lessons they do. I mean, get into apologetics and some of these things and teach like they do. And after about a year of doing it, I, I was miserable. And I remember going and praying one day and I was like, God, I don't think I want to be a teacher anymore. I thought I wanted to do this, but I don't, I don't like it. And it, it's just not me. And I, I don't feel like I'm doing <laughs> anything effective or anything. And I remember on that prayer time, it was like, God just sort of impressing this thought on me. Like, wh who are you? And I kind of puzzled at that for a while. And then I thought, you know, even though I'd gone into the ministry at that point, I was like, I'm a high school teacher. That's that's who I am. That's the level I like. I like to take hard things and explain it to people, maybe at a practical level. Um, and it was kind of like, yeah, you're a high school teacher. You're a street teacher. Um, I, I, somebody recently described it as a blue collar teacher. Like, I'll take that. Okay. Yeah. you know. And so I think I went through this process of discovering you know, what are the gifts that God gave me? What did God call me to do? What does it look like for me to be a teacher in my way, in, in the way that I do it with the passions that I have? And you know what? It looks nothing like the amazing ministry that Douglas Jacoby has. It looks nothing like uh, a John Oaks. It looks nothing like 
Steve Kennard. It, it just looks like me. But then now I've heard it from, you know, other guys coming up like, oh, man, how am I going to do what you do? And and now they're feeling this pressure to be a teacher, some people, in, in the way that I am. And so my encouragement is like, oh, forget all that bunk. Be who God made you to be. Be be a teacher in your own way. Don't don't be feel like you have to teach in a certain way, in a certain style, certain topics. Um, you know, learn from guys. Learn, uh, imitate, pattern after. But th that would be my biggest advice: is to find out your lane that God has laid out for you. I love what you're doing, Kyle. I love the angle you're bringing that no one else could. You know, I'm I'm not doing trauma theology. I'm not, uh, that's not my lane. Uh, you know, there's a lot of great teachers that couldn't even touch that stuff, but that's where God has brought together, you know, your many different gifts and uh, abilities and callings. And so that would be my advice is just, you know, be who God made you to be and do your thing. I appreciate that. And I appreciate, you know, again, the investment, I, I think, I think there's two things that I, I appreciate what you share, because I think there's two things I have found in the last couple of years specifically, it's just, it's, it can be very lonely. Um, I do believe that we need to be qualified in the secret places. And sometimes when it's lonely is where you go through that. And that's God is there, you know, but it can be very lonely. But at the same time, it's going to sound kind of hypocritical don't do it alone because I don't really trust my theological insights in a vacuum. For example, I feel so brilliant. And then I have one conversation with you or Jason Alexander or whoever. And it's like, whap, that theology doesn't hold any water at all. And it's like, yeah, we got to get checked. Like we, we need <laughs> our insights need some, you know, they need a wall to bounce off of. So, and then I think the other thing too, man, just a couple of years like ago, I just stopped trying to be an evangelist. And it, even now it's saying that I'm like, man, how do I feel about that? Like, <laughs> I'm not an evangelist. Well, no, I'm not. And that's, and like letting go of the need to be an evangelist in order to be a teacher. Um, it's just, I, there's a freedom now. And that was at the conference that we had in San Antonio that I was like, this is what I am okay, then I'm going to, I need to give that up, like this evangelist thing or whatever. And that I think some people, it's just kind of the ministry pathway. We've had old paradigms for ministry pathways, but yeah, I mean, just being what you are and embracing all of it, the insecurity, you know, all of it, I suppose. So, okay. Any upcoming announcements you want to make us aware of going on for you? Man, I, th I think we already spilled the beans on, on the, the good stuff, right? So, oh, wait a minute. Where are you going to speak next? What, what's what do you what's what, what do you look? What's your schedule looking like? Oh, good night. Um, you would ask me that, and I would not know. Um, so I'm actually going to Midwest Team Camp coming up. That's yes. that's the next thing for me. Uh, I'll be at, at at camp all week. That's that's one of my favorite weeks of the year. Honestly, that's it's so cool. I love doing that. I think um, got some things coming up in, <coughs> in September. Um, Going to go out and uh, be with some elders in Los Angeles in September and uh, teach in Philadelphia in September. Uh, and then a, a few other things were working out, but trying to uh, keep the, the, my speaking docket reasonable. And, yep. uh, you know, so um not not do too much so um not a ton this fall but uh, a few things that'll keep me busy well yeah that feels very reasonable and again i've you know just over the last couple of years i've seen how hard you work and how god has used you and it's really been god's spirit i mean that's what really creates a ministry is god's spirit and meeting needs and we just are this conduit so i want to say to you what i say to all my guests and I say it full hearted, which is that we are with you and God is for you, my brother. Thank you for joining Thanks us. Thanks for having me.